Knock High. Welcome, everybody, to Knock Knock High with the Glockenfleckens. I am Dr. Glockenflecken. I'm Lady Glockenflecken. We're so glad you're here. Uh, we have uh, a fun show uh, today. We're talking with a gastroenterologist. Yes. Our first GI doctor on the podcast. And not a specialty that overlaps with me very often. Wouldn't think so. No, you know, it's just not a lot of digestion in the eyeballs. No, there's really not. Yeah, you don't have to feed the eyeballs, so yeah. it's it's a very uh, uh, it was a new. So I had a lot of questions uh, just about his field, and um, and so we'll get to to our interview here in a second. But one thing that has come up recently uh, that uh, I honestly can't stop thinking about is this article that came out from uh, ProPublica about the inner workings of United Healthcare. And this was, they put out a call for stories, I want to say like f- almost a year ago. And is and United Healthcare like a hospital? United what Healthcare is it? Health Insurance Company. Okay. Yeah. And so they actually reached out to me to see if I could help, you know, sh- you know, share this uh, basically a call for stories. No, we so, got some health insurance stories. Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I, I helped kind of, sh- you know, spread the word that they were looking for this because I like, this is a great idea. So mm-hmm. ProPublica is a, um, a, I, I believe they're a nonprofit um, company or, or media organization. And they, they put out a lot of investigative reporting and stuff like that. So, I was like, Maybe we should mention we have no ties to ProPublica. Yeah, no, I have no ties to ProPublica. I just, I just like what they put out uh, a lot of, a lot of their work, and so uh, I, I helped uh, amplify their call for stories, and uh, they, I guess they got a whole lot, uh, which nice. is not surprising because there are so many people out there that have horror stories around health insurance, and so they just recently. Uh, they came out with a story about this uh, young man who was a student um, at, I, it's blanking on me where he was a student at, but basically in detailing, college. yeah, he was, in, he was in college, college student, and he was detailing his struggle with getting his treatment for inflammatory bowel disease covered. And it's just so hard to to read just the 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 pain and the all the the challenges and the denials and the letters and and ended up having a lawsuit about it and what we get through reading that story is some a little bit of insight into the tactics into the tactics exactly yeah that united healthcare and pro- honestly probably other Health insurance companies, I'm sure, are doing the same thing, but United in particular, and and um, the types of of physicians that they have reviewing claims and denying claims. These are doctors that haven't been in practice for 30 years and are not up to date with anything, and 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 so it's just the inner workings of United Healthcare as as far as you know their treatment of claims. It was really eye opening to me. And uh, the only reason we have all those details is because they were from depositions uh, as part of this lawsuit. Otherwise, there's no way any of this information would be privy to the general public. Right. Yeah, and, and see, it was like the basic philosophy is deny everything until, you know, something happens where we just can't deny it. Yeah, or or you're legally required to right. pay for it, or you know, that that's kind of what it takes, and uh, it's um, it's a harrowing story, and it makes it made me so angry, but also I'm so glad that they did that, and what it really drove home for me is the importance of sharing stories. Because we need examples of these health insurance companies and what they're doing to people. We need like actual anecdotal stories, which l- can lead to truth through subpoenas or deposition or whatever it takes. It all starts with the story, right? And and social media is such a powerful way to do that. And so I'm always encouraging people, okay, even if, who cares how many followers you have, it doesn't matter. If you have 
some a story to tell about health insurance, about the terrible things these health insurance companies do, share it because that matters. And that is the one area of society that health insurance companies can't control. They can't control social media. They can't control what people post, what people talk about. And so we need a lot more of that. So good on ProPublica for putting that out there. And I hope they do more. And I, I believe that they are. And so do you want to share your story of, of one of the, I mean, a story, I should say, we have many. Yeah, about... I guess, I guess my, you know, as a physician, I, for a long time, didn't really think too much about health insurance because, well, I mean, I, I should have, but I wasn't because I wasn't actually had to like use my health insurance very often. Uh, but uh, that did change when I had a cardiac arrest and had all these bills that were out of network bills, even though I was unconscious and didn't get to choose which hospital I was well, taken to. Well, and your hospital which... was in network. My hospital was in network, but some of the doctors were out of network. The doctor that treated you in the ICU was out of yeah. network. So it ended up with thousands and thousands of dollars in, in bills that insurance refused to pay. And it was a long, arduous six to nine month process um, eventually ending in the health insurance company putting pressure on the hospital to drop the charges, which is not what I wanted to happen. So they, they got it out of it anyway, and it was a very unsatisfying ending. And, and so that really got me on this path of putting out all this content that I do with, with health insurance companies. And they use tactics like that all the time. You know, there's no way to know as a patient, certainly not while you're unconscious, <laughs> but even if you're not, there's no obvious way to tell that that provider or this hospital or what have you is out of network. I mean, it's kind of an arduous process to even figure out which hospitals and which doctors are in network. And then there's no, you know, price tag on healthcare. And I think that a lot of people assume that doctors are walking away with a lot of money because the procedures cost so much or what have you. And I don't think there's a lot of recognition that actually the health insurance companies have a lot to say about how much things cost. And, and so, I mean, it just goes super, super deep. There's a million avenues of horror stories. So well done by ProPublica for putting that story out. And um, it's I, I encourage you all to go out and read it. it. It's it's really great. It's not behind a paywall or anything, so you should be able to, to access it. And um, yeah, I guess the, the bottom line is, you know, tell your stories, you know, get out there and uh, get on social media and talk about these things. And uh, because the more the more that's put out there for the public to read, the more people will realize, hey, a lot of us are in the same boat. A lot of people are experiencing the same hardships and challenges with health insurance. Um, yeah. So check that out with ProPublica. Um, let's get to our guests, should we? Yeah. All right. I could. We could talk about health insurance companies mm -hmm. all day. So we'll so we'll save it. Well, we're not gonna. We don't want to start off too angry with this podcast <laughs> sure. uh, because Kabe it just doesn't deserve. Yeah, that. it, it kind of it, it gets me fired up thinking about these <laughs> these insurance companies. All right. So yeah. Today, we have Dr. Kave Hoda, um, a, a friend of ours. We've, we've uh, been back and forth with podcasting for a while now. Um, he is a gastroenterologist and also the host of the House of Pod. Do you know what that's from, by the way? Yeah, it's a play on words um, for the House of God. The House of God, which is uh, an old novel that... Um, yeah, you know, everybody who's kind of gone through medical training is probably aware of that of that book. So uh, it's a play on the House of, which is a great great name for a podcast, mm -hmm. the House of Pod. Uh, and I've been on his podcast. You've co-hosted it. I've been on um, it and co-hosted. Yeah, so very familiar with him, and had a great conversation. So let's get to it. Here is Dr. Kave Hoda. Welcome, Kave. Thanks for coming on. We're, uh, we're so excited. I, I always love getting to talk with you. You know, you were the first, your podcast was the, I think the first podcast that I was ever a guest on. Wow. Is that, that can't right? be right. I think, I, no, I think right. it was because, because how long have you been doing the House of Pod? I wanted to say like a year, but it's been like five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's been longer than that for sure. Yeah. It's been and, like, yeah, five, four or five years. Yeah. Wow. And I just, I, cause it was before we had, it was pretty fairly early on in the kind of Glockenfleck and stuff. And so um, I, I, we didn't have a studio and 
I remember like the first like five or six podcast episodes that I recorded, I was sitting in my closet surrounded by clothing <laughs> like with this janky setup it was it was really uh very low budget that was early in the guacam verse and now look at you guys this is like uh, right this is legit. This like is, an I, actual yeah i feel like i won a contest or something being on this show this is exciting oh, no, no. for me this is great no you were you were high on the list uh it's always uh, fun to talk with you so you're a gastroenterologist yes uh i i know you from this podcast though i don't know you for your um your gi skills and knowledge not um, yet at some point <laughs> at some well, that's point gonna change. we're gonna learn more today that, that's gonna yes. change today um and so uh, what I wanted to start with is just why, just in general, like why, like I, I there's some yeah. specialties where it's just kind of like, yeah. why? Yeah, yeah what, no, this know? is a very loaded question that I get not infrequently, like patients will come in for the procedure, they'll be wheeled in and I'll be like, uh, you know, sir, do you have any questions for me? And they'll be like, why do you do this? <laughs> <laughs> Which, which I get. I mean, it's a weird gig when you look at the some of the stuff uh -huh. I do. But uh, you know, it, it depends. My answer will really range on like how much energy and how like nice the person seems. Because sometimes they're just like angry and they're just like, what the f wrong. Oh, sorry. Can I cuss? <laughs> you, you, you we'll can. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it okay, out. Okay, so sorry. The, <laughs> That's what, fine. What in their in their mind they're like, what is wrong with you? There's something deeply disturbed about you. And then sometimes they're actually really okay. curious. And then I'm like, okay, well, you know. It's a really fun part of medicine where you get to both be procedural and do things procedurally, mm -hmm. but you also get to think about fun things like the liver and there's a cerebral component to it and you put it together and they just still just look at me like I'm a jerk. And they're just like, well, you know, something's wrong. Some people are just mad that you made them <clears throat> drink all this, this prep. And, I understand. Uh, yeah, it's gross. And I get just it. live in the toilet for a while. And so, you know, you can understand why people would be a little bit upset about it. Do you have I a go-to quip for when it's the angry ones? Yeah, what do you say? What do you say? Uh, I have a How couple. You, uh, you know, the fun ones are the ones where they come in and they're like, um, how many of these have you done? And <laughs> if, if I get a sense that they have a good like sense of humor, I'll be like, this will be my first. But I watch it on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. I feel really good about it. And then they usually like laugh. Um, when when they're like really angry, I, I, or they they don't seem like they're gonna have a good sense of humor. I I, I say something along the lines of you know this is to help prevent colon cancer, and this is yeah. we're doing a lot of good with this. So you know I, I try to keep it pretty simple because um, I, I get it. People well mm -hmm. some people come in and they want a doctor to help relax them, and you know this probably better than anyone. They want a doctor to joke with them, and then there's some people who don't. They just want to come in. Right. They want to get their their thing done and they want to go and they don't want a lot of chit chat. And I understand that too. I mean, some people don't want to go onto a plane and have like their pilot telling jokes. I get that. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, I mean, for, for me, all my surgeries are, the patients are awake. So there's a wide range of, of how people react in those situations. Some, some people are like, tell me like step by step as you go. Like, I want to know what's happening. Mm -hmm. And then some people I'll like start doing that and they'll be like, please don't talk to me. <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> I don't want to know anything like, please, about please what's going on. Please yeah. don't, don't say anything. Just, yeah, yeah, just, I get do, it. just do the work, which I'm happy to do. Like, trust me, I would much rather just, just like, just all be silent and right. we'll listen to the music, whatever's playing. Right. But, I, but I don't think any of your patients are awake during a colonoscopy. No, right? Sometimes, sometimes they are, you know, we, we oftentimes use conscious sedation, which means you get like a little benzo, a little opiate, and you're like calm, and most of them will sleep through it or be in a twilight. Sometimes people are more awake than others, and then they're like, what, what is that? Is that, that, this is great. This is, a, and sometimes they really enjoy it. They're like, enjoy the experience. They're comfortable, and they're seeing what's yeah. going on in their body. It's like an underwater, like Jacques Cousteau exploration, but it's... <laughs> them as the star and they're really into it. So it's like, some people are like, and that's great. Those are, I, I love it when people ask questions, you know? Yeah, that, that could be fun. And <clears throat> it's because they're, you have the monitor for them. They can see it while yeah, you're yeah. doing the thing, right? Yeah, that's exactly Because I guess right. you're, you're behind them, obviously. Correct. So they have a nice unobstructed view of their own colon. <laughs> they do. Some people don't want to, you're right. Some people are like, I, yeah, they close their eyes and fall asleep. And you're, and... you're, you're I assume that like patients that are awake and talking and can kind of, 
you know, follow this, you're, I'm sure you're probably trying to put on a show too, right? You're doing the thing where you turn the camera back around on itself uh-huh. and you can kind of see. <laughs> yeah, I know, I've seen all your yeah. tricks. Yeah, I've seen no. a few colonoscopies in my yeah, day. Yeah, you sure have. No, you know, you got us down, buddy. We are showmen, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was always, I remember, because I did a, um, a GI rotation in med school, and one of the most exciting moments was always whether or not you could get through into the, the small intestine That's from right. the colon, right? You, yeah. you hit that... That, uh, that two-point conversion. Uh, that's, that's, trying, that's, you the ileocecal the ileo. valve. That's right, yeah. The, yeah. the ileocecal valve. There you go. See, are, listen, are you impressed? I, I, I'm, this is I'm very impressed. far away from the eyeball. Listen, I, I mean, basically rods and cones, and my limit of the eye stops there. So the fact that you know any of the anatomy of the, the gut is pretty impressive. <laughs> I'm getting there. Yeah. How, so how, what's the farthest you've ever gone into the small intestine? How far well, into the ileum can you get? You know, you're usually only going to get about like 15 centimeters. You're not getting that far. And that's pretty good. I mean, generally, I'm not even sure if every gastroenterologist has it as a goal to do that. Um, I usually try to go into the IC whenever possible, just because I'm a little OCD. Um, what I guess I guess that's a good question. What is it exactly that you're looking for when you do that part of the procedure? So if you're doing just colon cancer screening and you're looking for colon cancer, you usually don't need to go in there. You're looking at the colon for colon cancer. You don't need to look in the small intestine. Um, I oftentimes will anyways, just because if I find some inflammation there, then I'll, I'll, I'll be interested to figure out what that's all about, or if they have maybe a stool test that was positive for blood and I didn't see anything remarkable on the way in, I will poke my head into the TI terminal ileum as well to sort of you know, get a sense. This is this is fascinating stuff, isn't it for you? Just poking your head, the image of poking uh, that was uh, we, some right. good imagery there. On this there. podcast, we love making Kristen <laughs> as the... This, this is why it's so good to have her here on this podcast is because we need a non-medical voice yeah. and reaction. To, yeah, no. To the things that we just start are, are it's normal for us. Well, normal for you. I, I don't I'm routinely fully, talk about colons. I'm fully aware that my job is weird. <laughs> I, I mean, I all totally of your jobs are weird. Like medicine is weird. Was there was there a moment for you uh, that it like clicked? Is like, oh, this is what I want to do. Um, you know that there for me it was something I kind of had interest in early because there was some uh, I had family members who had some GI illness and I, that sort of got me down that path. Um, when you first start doing colonoscopies, I, I don't golf, but I assume it's a lot like golf where it's just super duper frustrating until you get it, until you start kind of figuring out what to do. And then uh, once you do that, it, it can be very satisfying. So, and, and I wasted so much of my youth playing video games. I felt like I had to sort of adapt that into a career. I feel like <laughs> GI was, like the, was, was a good way to do that, you know? So it was early for me. I don't know if there was one particular moment. I was trying to think of a uh, of a comp for video games. Like, what video game? Do you is control it like? the, the camera with Centipede, a joystick? Maybe I don't. Know. <laughs> you know, our our systems have to be updated. I mean, we we use like basically the same scopes with slight improvements in digital quality and 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 slight improvements overall. But we're using kind of the same technology that we've been using for years. Like, it would be nice at some point to hold like a playstation controller that's ergonomically sound in your hands basically driving (laughs) it through we're not there yet but maybe one day somebody needs to innovate and come up with that i would love to be a tester this idea of the day (laughs) yeah (laughs) um and i remember and you can do it pretty quickly too like these colonoscopies they don't uh i guess i mean the i remember the preceptor that i worked with on my rotation worked with the, the, the room i stood in the corner while watching a colonoscopy uh, i remember that it was like a like someone shooting a laser through the colon it was like yeah. like 15 20 minutes it seems i don't know if they go that fast but you know the 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 trick is to not try not to spend too much time on the way in you don't want to spend too much time there that's when it's uncomfortable for the patient um but to take more time on the way out that's when you're really looking at stuff so you know, studies have looked at this, and and if you're not taking at least six minutes to on your withdrawal, like what I tell like people in training is, I'm like, don't pull it out like you're starting a lawnmower. You have to like take some time on the way out. Like that's where you see the things. That's where you find the stuff. So oh, interesting. Yeah. So there okay. is some studies done on that. Like to, to is look it, and see. Uh, too late for me to call in sick today. <laughs> you're you're in it. You're okay. in it. We're talking about you are. We haven't it. even gotten to the prep. 
<laughs> You're going to experience this at some point. You know that, no, that's right? right? No, what, I'm in it, total probably. denial about that. <laughs> no, what what is the age now? Is it still, is it 50? Is so it... it's actually, this is a bit in flux. Now we are saying 45, but you know, this is sort of a, this is a bit of a, 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 a moving target right now. And, and I don't know if it's going to be the same thing five to 10 years from now. Um, you know, uh, there, there's not that much in terms of like real controversy in GI topics, you know, but there's a lot of discussion about some of them. And one of them is when to start screening, who to start screening, um, how to start screening. So that's an ongoing discussion. And those guidelines are going to continue to change uh, for quite a bit, I think. Right now, 45 is when we say you start colon cancer screening, gotcha. unless you have a family history or there's something else that makes you want to do it earlier. What if you just like it? You just <laughs> you just want to have a colonoscopy. I'm a charming like, fellow. Some people I'm sure want to come and get colonoscopies with me. I get it. Um, <laughs> actually, you well, won't be surprised. There be there are two yeah. camps. There are people who are very eager to get it. I don't know if anyone yeah. you know likes the experience. I don't think that's true. But right. there are people who yeah. are like probably like you guys who are like oh, I got to do this. And then there's some people who are like. I want to know what's going on. I want to make sure it's okay. I have a family member who had colon cancer. I want to get this squared away. I want to know. I'm actually in the camp of I I I won't I don't mind. Like I yeah, yeah I'll I'll do it. I mean my my body tends to grow things. I've you know I've had cancer a this couple times. Now I don't have an increased risk of of colon cancer, I yeah. don't think. But uh but you know, you give me a little propofol, just knock me out. I don't want to watch my own colon. You say uh, that you can, now, but you, you can might. record it and show it to me later. In fact, we could do maybe. How about my first colonoscopy? We can have a uh, a live. We can have a, like a, a rewatch, little, a little a watch, uh, party. Yeah, watch party. <laughs> Listen, um, I can yeah. invite you on. We can look at my colonoscopy. Listen, if Katie Couric could do it, you could that's do right. it ten times better. Oh, that's right. She, I would she did that, love right? yeah. to live stream your colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a, that's that's another idea. I was thinking we record it and show it later, but we could just live stream the thing. That's that's yeah. great. <laughs> All right. Um, so we've talked a lot about lower, but what about the upper? What what do you perf what's what's from your perspective? Do you have like a procedure? Do you enjoy doing upper endoscopies more than a colonoscopy, or do, are they all kind of the same to you? You know. They are. You do. I mean, they're all they're all fun to some degree, but you do them enough. Um, you know, they they stop becoming super duper special and that's probably good yeah. you don't want to be a patient with an interesting procedure but the procedure is <laughs> no. true that's true the the one i do that is really fun that i enjoy is the is a really challenging procedure called an ercp endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography and Oof. yeah you there like you that go. yeah there we go that's pretty good a lot of training to get that out <laughs> And See, um, can you say it five times? It's not fast. just ophthalmology with the crazy words. And, yeah, no, that's a and... that's our biggest one. I'm pretty sure that's our biggest one. And um, that's a procedure that's a little bit more challenging. It's a little bit more interesting. You go in from above, but the hard part is to get into these series of tubes and ducts that connect your gallbladder, your liver, your small intestine, your pancreas, and do work in there. Uh, so that's really difficult. It takes a long time to get good at. Um, you have to keep doing a lot of them to stay good at it. It's a really um, challenging procedure, has higher risk. It is more invasive, but uh, from a technical standpoint, it's it, that that's kind of in, enjoyable. Those are fun, the yeah, most fun. It's a satisfying type yeah. of procedure. I, re I remember seeing a couple of those. You have to wear lead, right? Yeah. 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 yeah I, I, as a med student, I hated it. Oh, yeah. It's it's the worst thing when you have to, you know, because usually, you know, for procedures, you're there to watch and learn a little bit, but you're not really usually doing it you don't i don't think you routinely have med students hold the no. colonoscope or the the whatever the upper one yeah, is yeah. called um but uh uh it's just you're like you're wearing that lead and it, it gets so heavy when you're just standing there doing nothing uh so that was my big takeaway you're uh, right. watching no, some you were, it, it's it's hot i'm a large it's mammal hot. will i'm you know <laughs> imagine if you were wearing like an 80 pound flesh jacket that's like me. <laughs> and then you have to, on top of that, put on lead <laughs> and then a gown on top of that to protect you. Yeah, it's really hot in there. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a problem. Yeah, that's a rough one. I swear. Are there any, are there any like any misconceptions about your field? Like things that people like me make fun of all the time that are, are not uh, actually that accurate? Well, 
Yeah, there was like this one dude who made like, it was like a TikTok guy and he made like this TikTok video about GI doctors like looking in the toilet at poop. I forget who that guy was. <laughs> it was you. That's right. It was you. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it was me. No, I did that. For for sure, I think the biggest, for sure, <laughs> I think one of the biggest misconceptions is how much people think our lives and our work revolve around poop. Like we're scatologists or something. Like I've been on, <laughs> I've been on like shows and podcasts where like there's just like maybe 40 minutes of questions about poop. And I'm like, guys, yeah. this is, you know, part of what I do. I deal with, I have to ask questions about it. But I guarantee you that your average ER doctor deals with poop way more frequently than I do. I mean, that's, <laughs> it's only part of what I do. There's so much more. Um, that's probably the biggest one, actually. Yeah. You know, we we actually don't see that much because people do this whole intense cleanse right. before they come in you to see us. You want to clean, yeah, right? So you can you see know, things. That's right. Poop poop just gets in the <clears throat> way. It's an annoyance. Well, I mean, look, don't get me wrong. Having a nice poop is important. I think that's a big part of someone's happiness. Did you know that when we had little babies, uh, Will here composed a poop song? Oh, yeah. I did. I would love I, I had a, to hear it. Yeah. Do you want to hear it? Should I, should I Can sing we? Song? Yeah. He would sing this okay. while changing the diapers. Uh, just keep in mind, like, we were we were delirious. Yeah. <laughs> like, so with our first surprised. kid... I can grab one of my bad. guitars and we could make this a whole uh, like thing. Yeah. Too. You know what? I, maybe, <laughs> just, maybe okay, just, maybe. just hear, let me just hear, hear the it. melody yeah, just, and then we can I'm, add I'm the... better at my poop song being a cappella. Gotcha. Uh, I got you. you know, okay. So, so anyway, yeah, we were just very delirious and just, you know, I had all kinds of issues like mentally <laughs> during that time period. So, you know, I, I made up a song because my kid was pooping, you know, however many stop. times a day, constantly. Um, so it goes, um, um, poop in the morning, poop at night, poop in the evening, poop delight, poop <laughs> when you're hungry, poop with all your might, poop in the evening, poop delight. So I would sing this That's... at 2 a.m. by myself, uh, with only my screaming baby. Mm -hmm. I think Until it's she not became a toddler and he was still singing it so much that she learned the words and sang along. Oh my she God, did. that's so cute. That's so cute. <laughs> I guess the point is, Kave, feel free to use that yeah. whenever you're... You're a musician. Take that. Yeah. It's yours. Run I'm going to remix it. that. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> Auto-tune you. It's going to be wonderful. <laughs> I, I do remember, though, on rounds. Let's talk about rounds. Yeah. Because... Um, some of my most vivid memories of my GI rotation were endless rounds. Like it, it, I almost felt like it was worse. Maybe it was just the team I was with, but you guys are so busy. You get GI gets a lot of consults. And I do remember for a lot of those people having to go into the bathroom and look in the toilet. Like I, it's mm. like it, like we did that. I don't know if yeah. it was just that fellow I was with. He's, he was a little bit of a strange <laughs> individual to be honest. <laughs> That may have just been his style. I don't know, uh, but it was maybe um, um, he was hazing you. Th uh, there, but there was a. He'd be like, he'd go over there. He'd he'd look in the toilet if he sees something. He'd be like, hey, hey, Will, come over here, come look at this. And I, <laughs> and as a med student, you know, you got to like pretend to be interested in everything. Yeah, and yeah. So that that was probably the hardest part of my of my life. You know that rotation that that. I don't know how necessary that is. Like, if someone tells me there's blood in their stool, I'll be like, was it a lot or a little? And I, uh, they can usually give me the words, but, I, but you know, I'm not gonna lie. Sometimes we look just because people expect us to. Like I'll yeah. be like, yeah, that's blood. Yep, that's blood in the stool, just like you mentioned. <laughs> so, sometimes, sometimes it, it is. There's like some. I'll be like, oh, this is a little darker than you guys made it out to be, or mm -hmm. you know, vice versa. Um, but yeah, generally, I, I don't need people to send me pictures of their bowel movements oh, uh generally I bet you I get a need, lot of that don't I you I get a lot of that and usually I don't need it I mean every now and then I will ask for some pictures or something but that's pretty rare because usually I'm able to elicit the stuff I need from like you know words uh and that that usually does the trick did you see the picture I sent you by the way <laughs> I you did yeah, you never got that very me. impressive how it coiled I have to tell you <laughs> Are you, uh, how often are you, uh, 
so you have you have a group of people, right? You have, yeah. So are you part of a, a group of gastroenterologists? Mm-hmm. And so how often are you in the hospital kind of doing rounds and well, I assume you, know, you take turns? Yeah, yeah. It, it totally varies on the groups. And some groups do it in very different ways. My group does a week at a time. So I actually just finished a, a week of call. Um, and that's that, that can be pretty grueling. That is like... A week of you're in every day working pretty hard. We I, I have a particularly busy hospital, and then when you go home, you could get called in at any point, which is which is a difficult part of the the gig. Um, it's part of the gig, but you know that that part of it can be very challenging. And if you're doing that for a week, it, yeah, that can be tough. I think I I know how to take GI call. Can Please. I? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, you, know, you get a call from uh, the emergency room because. A patient is um, has a lot of blood mm-hmm. per rectum. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just you get on the phone and you and you say, "All right, um, you know, let's stabilize the patient. We'll do a colonoscopy in the morning." That's pretty good. It's pretty is that, accurate. Is that good? I, I think you're about that... ready. <laughs> <laughs> that I mean, was an ophthalmology a... call. Well, let's then... see. The thing is, when I when I was uh, doing some research for one of my the GI videos that I did, I've only done like a couple, but um, uh, that was what I'd like to do is look at all these social media platforms. I see what people are complaining about. Yeah. Reddit's a great source for this. Uh, uh, and, and so, um, looking at like, what are the pet peeves for all these, you know, specialties? And yeah. that was something that I saw with uh, GI it was like, well, the patient has a bleed, they need a treatment, but they're not stable enough for treatment. And so how do you stabilize them? If you got to control the bleed to, in order for them to be stable, <laughs> it's like going around in a circle, uh, yeah. And so uh, I would like to hear your thoughts about that. You, no, I understand why people are frustrated about that. Um, the truth of it is m- most GI procedures are better served, and they've shown this, are better served by waiting until you have your full staff there, which is usually in the morning. You have everyone, all the equipment's there. The patient has gotten enough blood product to bring their blood up. They're on pressors and all that stuff is done. And importantly, you know, sometimes really you're – you're not doing the patient any favors by rushing in to do the procedure. There are some times when you're, you're actually going to, del- you're, all you're going to do is end up having to do two procedures. Like, for example, there are times when people will want me to come in, I'll be like, okay, well, we got to get the stabilized. Cause if I go in right now, all I'm going to see is blood. If there's a really bad bleed yeah. and, and then I just can't do anything. And then like, literally it's like, okay, I can't see anything. You know, we, we didn't have time to clear out the stomach. We didn't have time to stabilize them. So I can't get them into better sedation for whatever reason. So, you know, sometimes we're not just being obstructionist. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I'm sure there are people who just don't want to do it, but for the, for the most part, like, you know, if, if the, if I'm saying we should hold off on doing this right now, I mean, I'm trying to think of the patient's best interest, you know, and that's sometimes yeah. hard because we like our reflex is to like, okay, we, I got to go do something. I got to go put a scope in somebody. This is what I do. I, you know, I have to scope somebody right now. And sometimes it's better to, to wait a little bit. Well, Hey, ophthalmologists get, get, we get the obstructionist talk more than probably anybody else. Uh, but it's, uh, I, I agree with you in terms of the, having the staff, right. Uh, emergent eye, I just, you know, obviously that's the all the only thing I really know about. And so, um, like open globe injuries, you know, the kind of the more serious eye conditions, it's always a lot more difficult when you don't have like the, the your typical staff and setup, especially for specialized things. So, yeah. you know, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. The, it, it could wait. It's okay. Let's do it in the morning. Better for patient outcomes. Yeah. I think, you. I think it's just important to say that though, of like, Right. This is okay to wait yeah. on. Right. Nothing is going to happen between now and in the morning, and we'll be better equipped for it in the morning. Yeah, I think that's the like education. When people aspect get of it. nervous sure. when there's yeah. like internal bleeding, and you're saying, "Oh, let's just do this in the morning, get a good night's sleep." Right? They're going to spend that whole night just worrying. So no, I think to sure. say that up front yeah. is is helpful. Yeah, Absolutely. no, I mean, I did internal medicine residency in the chief year of residency. So, you know, I took care of a lot of sick patients in ICUs before I, you know, went on to GI fellowship. So, you know, I remember calling, you know, GI and other consultants in the middle of the night if I had to. That was sort of, you know, where I trained a big part of, you know, our training was to feel a sense of pride about doing as much as you could on your own um, and figuring out as much as you could on your own. But you know, um, it, 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 I know what it's like to, to be dismissed. So, uh, you know, I, I hope I, I don't come across that way to when, when people call, I don't know what, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, my I was niceness, gonna ask you. 
my nicest what, where, definitely where does gi stand on the kind of angry angry consultant getting <laughs> called in the middle of the night scale uh you know i'm i'm i only get a little bit annoyed when one of a couple things happens one sometimes people call like just ready for a fight and maybe they've had a phone call with an angry neurosurgeon just a minute ago but they're just like they're in they're like yeah there's like angry giving you the information i'm like whoa dude this is like one in the morning give me a moment to like you know warm me up to this conversation and then sometimes it's um when i get the sense that you know they're having me do the chart biopsy for them look into what i'm like you you know this is not that challenging it is the patient on blood thinners you know that's something you can tell me i don't have to look that up um but but generally I, i mean i don't find most most People don't call those consults without having some thought go into it. I try and remember that, and I try to remember that you yeah. know they they need help at what one form or another. They need help. Sometimes you know they'll be like, "I just want to give you a heads up." Oh, like like <laughs> last week, I got a call at like two, and the and uh, the guy answers the phone and he's like, "Okay, uh, you want the MRN?" I'm like, "Dude, it's two in the morning. I'm not in front of a computer." <laughs> just tell me the story <laughs> logged into epic <laughs> yeah like just to go. waiting to go and and he was like it was just a, it was just a heads up for the next day and i'm like you know I, yeah. I, there's nothing i'm going to tell you right now that's going to change a thing i don't you don't need to let me know that but thankfully that's pretty, that's not common that's not very typical yeah yeah it's uh you know the the heads up I've, i get some of those as well with uh with eye problems you know is conditions. there not a better way to give each other a heads up can you send a text well, or an you know, email it's, or something it's hard because you know you got the, <laughs> i mean most of these i think most of this comes down to it's just hard to communicate at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> yeah like for i think for everyone involved yeah. right and so uh in a perfect world like we'd all you know understand each other's personalities perfectly and how awake somebody is and how asleep somebody else yeah. is and you would you know have just the the perfect intonation and everything but it just you know so people are going to be a little bit on edge in the middle of the night uh and uh but yeah i think for a lot some a lot of non-urgent things you know waiting until you know five or six in the morning you know, is, is I, and, and with, uh, when I'm on call, like we have, I, I cover a lot of community hospitals and, uh, there's, uh, that's what a lot of the emergency physicians will do. They'd be like, okay, well, this patient came in as having double vision. I know they need to be seen the next day or two. Um, even if they came in at two o'clock in the morning, a lot of times they'll just give me a call like five or six in the morning. So like, you know, at least you give the person some inter- uninterrupted sleep. And so, I understand that's not always possible, but you know, I think it's a good way to go about it. Yeah. I mean, we have to, as consultants, always remember what it was like. And people who are calling us have yes. to also understand they're not getting the best from us at two in the morning. <laughs> You're just not going to get like the yeah. best, most thoughtful, like, mm, this patient's really sick. I need to figure it all out. You're not going to get that all mm-hmm. right then. You, you got to give them some time. Yeah. I, where does where does it's, opso? Because I've never called. I don't know if I've ever called an opso consult. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're it's probably we're, not a lot. We're of like overlap. the black box of medicine. No one really uh, knows what happens that's so over smart. here. <laughs> <It's> so smart. So <laughs> smart. Um, you know, I I take. I think I. I don't say a lot of words, but I I don't think I'm I'm ne- I don't get upset. I don't think I've never. I can't think of a time when I've you know, been angry on the phone. Um, it's, it's more just, you know, there's times I can tell you're irritated. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah you can but tell. It's, I mean, maybe that's just because I know. Yeah. You so I, well I really know what your hard. irritation sounds like. Do, yeah. do you feel like after all these years, you could answer some of the questions for him? Do you feel like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, like for sure. Like A lot what? of it is just, is there vision loss? Um, has it changed, right? Has the vision changed at all? Artificial tears, hot compresses. Yes, I, that was what I was about to say next. <laughs> See, and that, so you do that and then <laughs> send them to the clinic in the morning. We've got some scheduled, you know, slots for, for call patients. We'll slip them right in. Yeah, that's pretty good. Come right in. I'll, I'll see them in the morning. I really want you to take call for me. See, I can do it. <laughs> I think I think I think we're gonna explore this. Yeah. All right. You should let's, check out the legality take a, of it. 
<laughs> yeah, that That's might true. be a problem. Well, I think uh, also medical, I'd like to sleep a lot. I think medical licenses can be transferred to the spouse, right? Or is that just something I made? <laughs> no, up? I, I think that's know. the reason to get married. It's like taxes yeah. and that. <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break, and then we'll be back with Cave to uh, do something a little fun. A big thank you to all our listeners. Spread the love. Share this podcast with everyone you know. Every single person. Everybody. (laughs) as Like every person you know. Leave a rating and review. Be honest. You can tell us what you think. We want to improve this thing as we go. Uh, Later today, we're going to share some of your own medical stories. You can share yours at knockknockhigh at human-content.com. We also have a Patreon. Come hang out with other members of this community. Uh, early episode access check out bonus episodes where we react to medical shows and movies and it's just a lot of fun so come hang out with us all right now let's get back to dr kave hoda all right we were back with dr kave hoda and we are going to play a little game kave we're gonna do battle of the specialties Okay. Right. Okay. I think I've done this once before, uh, but not never with a gastroenterologist. All right. So the way this works is okay. we are going to make arguments for who has the better specialty. Hmm. Kristen here is the med student. We are trying okay. to convince her that they should choose our specialty. The twist is that you have to convince her that you, she should be an ophthalmologist. Hmm. Easy. And I have to convince her that she should be a gastroenterologist. Do you know what I do for a living? Okay. I know, and I, it's, I've, I've had to put a lot of thought into this okay. to figure out you know, exactly <laughs> how I can uh, compete here. Okay, because I think uh, I have the right, advantage. So, uh, yeah, yeah uh, we'll see. We'll okay. see. Let's, uh, right. okay. let's, let's give this a shot here. All right, do you want to go first or me? Uh, you know, let me it. go first. Okay, you go let first. Let me go first. I need, I, need I need the opening. I need to, to try to, you know, grab the attention you're right you're and I let's have the get you thinking here. about gi before we introduce ophthalmology i'm okay. scared here we go Kristen, you should do optim you should <laughs> Kristen, you should be a gastroenterologist why is that all right well the first thing obviously it's i think it's an easier word to spell than ophthalmology and you're going to be spelling it a lot all right okay but i am a good speller you are a good speller but uh here's the thing when there is something wrong with your poop and the uh-huh. way you poop, uh-huh. it's incredibly distressing. Sure. Right? Mm-hmm. Like it's 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 like it's never it's such a a a challenge. And you're, you're constantly thinking about it. Like, oh man, my poop is I'm either you're pooping too much or not enough or it's too difficult or it's way too easy. And you got and, and so from the patient standpoint, you're like, man, I just, I want someone to fix this for me. Mm-hmm. Figure, to help me, help me, help me poop better. And that's, that's a part of the job of a gastroenterologist is to help figure out why your poop isn't normal. And it can be a very big um, a quality of life issue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. <clears throat> that's, that's my first point. <laughs> Wow, you're you're not even trying. You're not even at this <laughs> point. You're not even. All right, <clears throat> here's Let's here's hear my what do you got? My rebuttal, <clears throat> uh, and this is this is to you, Will. Uh, have you ever had to get up in the middle of the night to go pull a hot dog out of somebody's throat? <laughs> no. Do you know the things I've pulled out of people? I've done unspeakable <laughs> things. <laughs> Give, a, give us a couple examples. You know, I, actually, I'll tell you what. I, I, we used to have this bit on the show, on, on our, my podcast, and we would have on a GI doctor or an ER doctor, and we'd bring them on, and, and we'd talk about that. And I, I, there's no doubt. It, it is, some of the stuff is amazing and, and mind-blowing. But at some point, I started to just be like, you know what? It is hilarious, but this was someone's like worst day having to go in with like this thing I had to pull out of them. So, it, and I always have this, this fear that one day they'll listen and be like, yeah, that was me. That was my butt. And so <laughs> that's true. I, you I don't, don't have to tell any, us. I don't say it anymore. That's, yeah. Yeah. You can go okay. back to the old episodes if you but want. But you're them. proving my point for me. Uh, because, <laughs> because how wonderful is it to have someone who cares and who shows compassion for you I, as a person with something stuck in your butt? I don't know that they feel wonderful. I think they feel mortified. 
but they get that it they fixed. had to mm. show someone whatever their situation was. It's true. Sometimes well, you can it, laugh uh, about it. What do you got? Uh, tell us what what about ophthalmology? You think should okay? Uh, I think this is this is a no brainer. I mean, you're helping people see there is some grandmother out there who is now watching her grandson's Peter Pan performance in elementary school because you fixed their vision and they went from no vision to vision or some you know impaired vision to vision and that's a real tangible thing that you did I, that's pretty awesome that's like you know sometimes what i do as a gastroenterologist you go in there and you make people go through this whole process and then you're like hey good news i took out a two millimeter polyp for you and it's important that you do that very important but they don't walk away being like oh i feel so much better i had that polyp removed it's not Cou that immediate relief counterpoint counterpoint you can give the patient the polyp. <laughs> like a little, like a little, little jar. Little like a necklace bag. out of it. Yeah. Little you know, when you're doing cataract surgery, you know, the cataract's gone. You break it up into a thousand little pieces. You emulsify it and suck it out of a vacuum and it's gone. You yeah. don't get to keep the cataract. But I, actually, I'm, I probably shouldn't say, I, I shouldn't assume you can keep your polyps. No, you can't. You got to send it to the lab and oh, have it okay. looked at right. and see what kind well, of polyp it is. At my gastroenterology shop, you get to keep the polyps. <laughs> They're like, mm. we don't care what kind of polyp it was. We'll assume it was a really bad one. Here, <laughs> go. All right. Um, Do you ever just like take a picture of it for them and then like draw a face with like a mustache and just make it like a little happy polyp? I haven't yet. <laughs> that, that would be a good poster to put on the wall of, yeah. of your clinic. You know, you know? Uh, Peter the Polyp. We, we, we Polyps do take, have we, feelings too. That's right. <laughs> uh, we, all right, here we go. APAB, all polyps are bastards. They need to uh, all come out. <laughs> that's true. Uh, that's right. The polyps, there's never a good polyp, right? It's all bad. All bad yeah, polyps. I mean, there's variations of it. There's hyperplastic ones, which are not to worry about at all. But in general, yeah, you want to get rid of polyps if they're there. Get rid of them. You want a nice clean colon. That's right. With just the Rugae in there. Mm. Oh, look, the Haustra. The, oh, is that? No, the, it's, oh, Rugae is stomach. the stomach, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Ha, ha, Haustra? Yeah. Haustra, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the like little things, the rings. The folds, yeah. yeah the rings. The folds. The rings, yeah. Um, <laughs> Whatever you call it. Pretty good. Lovely. I mean, you're, you, you got, <laughs> you mean you got, I, you're in the ballpark. I haven't even gotten to sphincters yet. Mm. Sphincter um, talk. <laughs> that's something that the two of us have in <clears> common, you know. Oh, ophthalmology and GI. Um, eye sphincters, okay. huh? Yep. The iris has sphincters in it. All right. Oh, oh, um, oh. And they do an important job. I The sphincters that you are um, in charge of also have a very important job. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, they are very important. You should have them functioning. But um, you, I don't have any control over the sphincters in the eye, though. You, you know, you have sphincters that you can actually control. Which sometimes, is, yeah. Sometimes, a little bit. Sometimes it's quite challenging. Part. That's a real problem if it's a sphincter problem. But there are things we can do. Yeah. But I mean, you're also you're also touching on something that's very good about ophthalmology, which is that there is like really interesting like biology and anatomy there. You have this one tiny little organ and all this stuff is crammed into it. And it's sort of at the nexus of like medicine and neuro neurology and and surgery and there's all this exciting i assume <laughs> research going on <laughs> <laughs> I just, i'm assuming there is i don't i don't keep up on the opto research but there's all this like it's at the it's a, it's really like you know uh, where all these things meet that's pretty cool it's a good point all right but yeah. uh you get to focus all your energy on a tube yeah on a long mm -hmm. tube and uh, and so it's internal medicine, but kind of not really. I don't know. It, it's it's uh, I, actually that's not true. You do like do liver stuff, right? And, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. No, but that's part right. of the tube. It's part of the digestive process. It's a digestive yeah. organ. Yeah, I think it's cool to just have be able to focus on you know the health of the tube. Yeah, that's what do I do. Do you call it I'm a tube? tube. Yeah, I, don't, yeah, I that's keep what saying I do. tube. I say yeah. when I when right. I have a patient, I say, look, I'm gonna put this tube into your tube. And if I see anything funny in your tube, I'm gonna. And they love it. Gonna draw patients, a face on it. Patients just love it. <laughs> they, they, I bet they do. Um, okay, here's 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 a a, a reason to love okay. being a gastroenterologist. Okay. Um, the jokes. Mm. 
Mm. Mm-hmm. That you can't. It, it's that's a good it's point. Joke heaven. Yeah. Like you, there's no when you're when you're in a situation that is a bit embarrassing uh, for everyone involved. Just you got the jokes right yeah. there. They 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 write themselves in gastroenterology. You will not find a GI doctor that doesn't have a good sense of humor. And and you get to hang out with other people who have a good sense of humor. Ophthalmologists, it's a little rough out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. More of a serious punch. I got to be honest. I know one other ophthalmologist. <laughs> know any <laughs> ophthalmologist that's so funny now that i think about it i can't argue with you <laughs> because that's right. i just don't know enough of them and you have fart jokes so we do you know. we have jokes and and patients have jokes when they come in which i love i mean i've heard yeah. most of them but it's always like the old like uh, farmer guy comes in has a joke about like before you do the colonoscopy i always appreciate that i love yeah. that yeah yeah Gotta I diffuse mean, the tension oh yeah for sure if you work with anuses as much as we do and you don't have a sense of humor about it then you are one i uh, <laughs> you know that's life lessons from kave i that's, make a shirt out go. of that that's good <laughs> exactly sell some merch yeah well Kristen, what do you think do you want to be a an ophthalmologist or a gastroenterologist well i would very much like to be neither but if i have to choose Based on these arguments alone, I think I would have to choose ophthalmology. Yeah. So, so I think I win. What do I win? Cave is the winner. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm I guess conflicted you're both kind because of a I'm kind of a winner, but also not really. Uh, I guess uh, this last time we did, I, we did this with an ophthalmology and emergency medicine, and, yeah, yeah. and you did not choose ophthalmology. Well, there you and go. So now you are. So, mm. so, um, I, I think I don't know what that says about gastroenterology as a specialty. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not for everyone. I will say this though. Here's my here's my uh, pitch for you know the kids out there listening right now who are thinking sure. about it. L- like I said earlier, there aren't that many. Uh, I don't know if the grammar is correct on that, but there isn't that many fields of medicine where you get to be so procedural but then there is this other component to it where you get to really get to know patients work with them in acute care settings and then also chronic care settings and there's a little bit of the procedural aspect and you can do you know as as much of that as you want you can go deep down that rabbit hole so to speak and and go down that path and, and learn more and more procedural stuff it's a fun gig in that way and you can really do some really important stuff in terms of not just colon cancer but liver cancer pancreatic cancer cholangiocarcinoma you name it um it's all awesome. there is there's some real uh you know pluses and you get to play video games basically all day in the <laughs> human body true. I, I have it, a very serious question yeah um, if a patient were to run into their gastroenterologist mm. in the wild, yes. say at the grocery store, what should that patient say? It, it happens not infrequently, and <laughs> in you know, um, so it, it yeah, you, we we do run into people. I will never go up to someone I recognize and be like, "Hey, Mr. Burns, remember I'm the guy that was in your tube? Remember we talked <laughs> about your tube? I was in your tube." Um, but if they come up to me or if they notice me, I'm I'm happy to let them direct it. I follow their lead on that. Yeah. What yeah, if they great. just awkwardly avoid eye contact like I would do? Well, it's me with most people. <laughs> <laughs> just let it go. Yeah. yeah. I think it's okay to pretend you don't see each other. Yeah. I think it's fine. Yeah, totally. <laughs> All right. Let's take a quick break and then uh, we'll be back with some of your medical stories. All right. Be right back with Kaveh Hoda. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at some of our favorite medical stories that were sent in by you, the listeners. We still have Dr. Hoda with us to uh, listen to some of these. We got got a couple of good ones today. Uh, You're going to appreciate this first one. So this is from Nate. Nate is a PA student. He says, on one of my directed H&P practicals, my patient was presenting with abdominal pain, which I was rather certain was cholecystitis. Naturally, I went to perform a Murphy's sign exam on them. I explained how it would work and did my thing and proud that I had performed it correctly. After my practical, my faculty member grading me said I did well, but asked, Hey, Nate, 
<laughs> Which side of the body is the gallbladder on? <laughs> I did the exam on the patient's left side. So. <laughs> what if it was situs and versus, you know? What if you never know? That you, is the way to recover from that situation. You have to check that side first. You know what? <laughs> yeah, I know it's on that side, but first I want to check the other side just to because you got to know for sure. Would I look silly if I didn't get that? I yes. would be silly if I didn't get situs and versus. This is coming from a gastro inter a board certified, I assume, yeah. gastroenterologist. <laughs> it's a good assumption. It's a tough test. <laughs> It's okay. Just as you know, check. Yeah, make sure you do a very thorough bilateral. Here's, here's exam. my question, though. <laughs> bilateral. Here's my question: How long does that exam take? Oh, that's quick. Yeah. Like, the, I mean, five seconds or like no, just a feeling, minute. You're feeling for the. That's when you breathe and like you feel like the liver go down, yeah. right? And you, <laughs> and you try to feel if there's tenderness where the gallbladder is, and it's on the right side. It yeah. lies underneath yeah. the liver, which is this really large organ that's in your right upper quadrant of your abdomen. And it's like this little sac that hangs out underneath it. And you try to get underneath it or around it to see if there's a lot of inflammation there. So, so if you're a student, mm -hmm. I'm going to guess it's going to take you a, a little while to get in there and do that. So my question is, why did he wait until the student was done before saying, hey? Well, this was an exam. Oh, okay. So this so it was a practical. It's not so, just called an exam like I'm doing no, no, an exam like, on the patient. He was, was actually like, taking yeah, a test. Yeah, taking a test. Gotcha. Right. I, I want to know okay. if he passed. Did, <laughs> did well, evidently you know not. It, in, in Nate's <laughs> in Nate's defense, like those practicals, I remember taking those, and you know, you're nervous. You're just. Mm. You, I, I could totally see that happen. I remember I failed. I failed one of my uh, OSCEs, We call them OSCE. Mm. I don't mm -hmm. know if they're still mm -hmm. called that. Yeah, where like so. standardized patient exams. Uh, because uh, it, I forgot to ask, get the information of whether or not the patient was pregnant, oh, or I, I forgot right. to say we need to do a pregnancy test, and that was the diagnosis. <laughs> I just absolutely failed it, uh, I, and so um, yeah, I mean, you, I, you just kind of like your brain short circuits, and you, you don't you know, remember. I, I hated those exams, and I don't know if yeah. you guys had this, but this happened to me on like more than one occasion. They wanted you to learn how to deal with a very difficult patient, and I remember like. I had this one patient who's like the actor who was being the patient was instructed to basically not talk to me at all, like, and to be really like very standoffish. And so like, I'm doing this whole thing. I'm just like trying for like 10 minutes to get this person to open up to me. They answer my questions. And then they're like, at the end of it, I'm like, all right, I mean, uh, what am I supposed to do here? They're not answering my questions. I mean, they're like, you were supposed to ask about her son. And I'm like, Okay, but oh. like that has nothing to do with what she's here for. I mean, like I get it. Like you have to yeah. like know the person, but I'm like, come on, let's like be realistic. If like you know, we have like 15 yep. to 20 minutes. I'm trying to like be sociable with her and friendly and show her I care. And if I didn't ask the one particular thing that like she was instructed to like open up to me about, like that's kind of silly. Like I, I can I can win over a patient without knowing that one particular like key phrase. And I hated those right. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're they try to trick you and they you know not exactly like it is in real life. But all right, let's go to um story number two. So this is from McKinsey. I am a loyal Jonathan, aka scribe for a retina surgeon. Here's a funny story uh from a recent interaction. We had a patient the other day that has some dementia or Alzheimer's. She was finished with her visit and I stood by her chair to help her up. She rubbed my stomach and said, that's a belly. <laughs> oh boy. I couldn't quite tell if she caught herself <laughs> before asking when the baby was due. <laughs> In parentheses, I'm not pregnant. <laughs> Or if it was just an observation, she decided to verbalize. Either way, I thought it was cute. <laughs> well, I'm glad she thought it was cute and not horribly offensive. <laughs> well, you know, whenever, you know, I, I, as someone who most of my patients are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, when you're, you're, when you have patients that have dementia, you know, they get a pass on sure, some things. Sure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that was, I like that. That was a good story. I had a patient. Right, so, I had a patient before yeah. uh, COVID hit when we were still seeing people frequently in the office and it wasn't that long ago. And and I remember walking in, she looked at me and she was, she's not demented. And she just looked at me. She was like, you look awful. 
question. <laughs> Thanks. I was like, oh, all right, <laughs> let's proceed with your colonoscopy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for those stories, Nate and Mackenzie. Send us yours, knock knock high at human content.com. Kave, thank you so much for joining us. That was a blast. Always good to talk with you. <laughs> yeah, you guys are great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So before you go, um, tell us where to find you. Uh, so uh, I have a podcast. It's sort of like the Kirkland version of this podcast. Um, it's called The House of Pod. <laughs> If you if you like this, you probably will in, enjoy uh, my podcast as well. You can find it pretty much everywhere uh, except Spotify. We're pretty much everywhere else, and uh, you can if you're on Twitter and you know you still want to yeah. do that. I'm there at the House of Pod, um, and uh, yeah, thanks it's for a great thank, podcast. It's a lot you. of fun. I've been on there twice, I think. Uh, I've enjoyed it three times. I oh, got every to time. co-host. You she, co-hosted. She co-host. did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you've been awesome. on. A total of three times because we just did one with Michael Weber. Oh, that's right. We did yeah, the yeah. movie that's one. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, you have uh, a lot of interesting guests come on, and so it's definitely you know check out the House of Pod P O D. Um, all right. Well, thanks again, Kave. Always a pleasure. Can't wait to hear the music to that poop song. Yeah, I'm gonna Let get to know. work. Yep, yep, yep. Thank you yeah, guys so much. Recording. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Well, our first conversation with a gastroenterologist went about as well as I could have hoped. Yeah. Lots of poop talk. A lot. And you got to demonstrate your musical prowess. I did. Uh, yes. I was not coming on this episode today prepared to <laughs> display my singing, but thank you for bringing that up. Full of surprises. <laughs> Full of surprises. You never know what you're going to get on this podcast. <laughs> All right. So, but a big thanks to Kave. He's a, a great guy. Uh, yeah. And, uh, on, you know, he was talking about gastroenterology. And honestly, it is a really good specialty I, because of the wide range of things that you can do. Like, the yeah. you like procedures, but maybe you don't want to be a surgeon. And maybe uh, you don't want to specialize in just one organ. Yeah. yeah. And, and you get the, uh, the outpatient side of things, but also dabbling in a little hospital that's that's where it that's where that's where you fall off that's where i am like nah i could i could handle i could handle the poop i could handle the colonoscopies i I like procedures but it's it's hospital medicine i just for some reason what is it about hospital medicine that you don't like what is it's what does hospital medicine refer to i think it's i i like knowing when my day is going to end sure (laughs) like and that was the the, the, the distinct uh, uh, experience of hospital medicine was, when is this over? <laughs> and in many cases, it's never over. I Sickness very much doesn't sleep. enjoyed having like, okay, this is my last appointment. And when I'm done, I get to go do something else. And that's just how I am. Sure. So anyway, but I, I think uh, it's a good option. Yeah. Um, Lots of variety. Yeah. So thank you also for sending in your stories. Uh, I was like, wait, what what were we talking about? I was totally got sidetracked on the gastroenterology poop talk. But yes, (laughs) thank you for sending in your stories. And um, uh, let us know what you think. You know, if we have other specialties or guests that you want us to talk to, you know, let us know. We're always open to suggestions. Uh, There's lots of ways to hit us up. You can email us, knockknockhi at human-content.com. Uh, we're on social media, TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, and you can also hang out with us and our human content podcast family. I said that correctly this time on Instagram and uh, don't, you're just humoring me now. I'm, I'm being encouraging. <laughs> Very good. Jeez. You said it right. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> Our human, I'm going to say it again because I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> human content podcast family on Instagram and TikTok at human content pods. Shout out uh, to all the great listeners leaving wonderful feedback and awesome reviews. If you subscribe and comment on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube, we can give you a shout out. Curl619 on Apple said the show is fantastic. Lady G's uh, female and non-medical perspective really adds depth and relatability to the show. Can't wait to keep listening. Thank you. I totally agree. I really do. Do it's, you? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's we nice. need. Oh, we need. We need 
it, it gets it can get really boring when there's just doctors talking to each other. Mm. Like we need we need that perspective outside of medicine. So yeah. I really appreciate what you bring to the podcast. Well, thank you. Uh, our uh, full episodes, video episodes, full video episodes are up on my YouTube channel at D Glockenflecken. We have a Patreon with lots of cool perks, bonus episodes uh, where we react to medical shows and movies. You can hang out with other members of the Knock Knock High community. We're there. We're posting, mm -hmm. making videos, telling jokes. Uh, you can also get early ad-free episode access, interactive Q&A live stream events, a lot more coming. That's patreon.com slash glockenflecken or go to glockenflecken.com for more info. Speaking of Patreon community perks, new member shout out. We got Laura Lee M, Betsy H, Maggie S, Joan I, I think it's an I or an L, Joan I, and Corin B. Corinne. Uh, Corinne. Corinne B. I'm not good at pronouncing names. I do the best I can, everyone. Uh, also, shout out to the Jonathans, uh, a virtual head nod to all of you. Patrick, Lucia C, Sharon S, Omar, Edward K, Abby H, Stephen G, Rossbox, Jonathan F, Marion W, Mr. Granddaddy, Caitlin C, Brianna L, and Becky. Next, we have Patreon Roulette. So if you are on the emergency medicine tier of our Patreon, then we will give you a, a, we'll give a random shout out to one of you. So, uh, you ready? All right, ready. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give, the, I'm gonna throw it to you. You're gonna okay. name it. I'm gonna give you the drum roll. Okay. Maddie M. Maddie M. Thank you for being a patron. And thank you all for listening. We are your hosts, Will and Kristen Flannery, also known as the Glock and Flecken. Special thanks to our guests today, Dr. Kave Hoda. Our executive producers are Will Flannery, Kristen Flannery, Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, and Shanti Brook. Our editor and engineer is Jason Portizo. Music by Omar Binsvi. To learn about our Knock Knock Highs, program disclaimer and ethics policy, submission verification, and licensing terms, and HIPAA release terms, you can go to glockandflecken.com or reach out to us, knockknockhigh at human-content.com. With any questions, concerns, fun medical jokes, patient satisfaction surveys, <laughs> whatever you want. Knock Knock High is a human content production. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.